<clears throat> Good morning. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to this church. We did uh, the service for Jack Fowler yesterday, and um, the way you guys stepped up was incredible. And I had person after person come and talk to me about what a blessing this church was. Helping Marge take care of the announcements, helping her take care of the preparations. Uh, the women stepped up, took care of all of the, the food. Uh, Josh and Mackenzie put together the slideshow. Um, our worship team came and did the music. Um, I, I tend to take it for granted because that's how this body operates. But it kind of opened my eyes anew to what a blessed fellowship we have. So I want to say thank you very much for being what God has called you to be. Um, at this point, we have uh, Jerome Yoder from the Gideons. He's going to come and share with us, so I'm going to turn the service over to him until he's done. <coughs> Uh, Thirteen-year-old John Price uh, had two parents. They were both atheists and they're both alcoholics. They were in a, a hotel room in, in Miami and uh, the mother's passed out on the bed. The father's off somewhere doing whatever. Uh, John was tired of watching TV and he was uh, bored. To, he, he opened up a drawer and there was a, a Bible there, a Gideon Place Bible he found. But he knew that he wasn't supposed to read that Bible because his parents had warned him it was, it was full of lies, it was full of fairy tales, and uh, don't believe it. But uh, one's sleeping, the other's gone, so, so he opened it up and read it anyway. Psalm 27, 10 he read, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. And he slammed that book shut. He said, whoa, this, this book knows me. This thing's talking to me. <laughs> This this is this is a, this is a, is a true a true book, but that that verse just pierced his heart. He didn't uh, when he left. He took that Bible with him. He snuck it in, took it with him, and, and, and didn't let his parents see it. When he had any free time, he read that book, and it wasn't very long. And he uh, he realized he had a need for God, and he needed Jesus Christ, and he accepted him as his Savior. Today, John K. Price II serves as a pastor in Clintwood, Virginia. Mm -hmm. All because of God's grace and a church that gave some money and a Gideon that was faithful to place that Bible in a hotel. That was, but it was, it was God's doing that, uh, that, that took care of this. Uh, in Isaiah 55, 11, the Lord tells us, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. So it's going to go where I, where I want it to go. It's going to do what I want it to do, but it shall not return unto me void. And that, that prophecy was fulfilled that day in, uh, in John. <coughs> um, Harvey, uh, Harvey Wilson was a maintenance man for uh, Delta Airlines in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And, and one day he picked a, uh, a little green book out of, out of the garbage can. It was, it was a Gideon Testament. He, but he was already a believer, but he, he, he laid that book on his desk and he thought, well, and, and prayed that God would, would, use, that, would use that book. And... Uh, and he started noticing there was stuff going on at his desk. There was crumbs there, there was uh, stuff was moved around, and, and he found out later that this young man that also worked at the airlines would go in there, on the, on, he worked in the night shift, he'd go in there and have his lunch there, and then he'd hide out there so he didn't have to work, and well, he had nothing to do, so he'd read that, he read that Bible. And it wasn't very long before he realized that he needed God, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his, uh, as his Savior also. You know that that book. It, somebody pitched it in the garbage. They're done with it. It it, it it was it was it was nothing to them. God wasn't done with it. Mm -hmm. He still had a use for it. He, uh, and it went to you know it was put to a put to a good good use. So uh, and I'm here this morning as a as a representative of that Gideon Association that placed that that Bible in that uh, not in the dumpster. But in that <laughs> we, the dumpster. we know a lot of men. Down we go down to Missoula and, and every fall and pass out. Some 2,200 Bibles at the University of Montana. Well, I'm sure some of them end up in dumpsters, but uh, 
but you know, you, you never know when you hand somebody that Bible, you never know what it's going to do. They may catch it, they may, uh, uh, it, it may go on to, to, to impact many lives, you just, you just never know. Well, who are the Gideons anyway? What do they do? Why do they do what they do? Uh, the Gideons are a non-denominational association of Christian and professional men. These men are born-again believers. These men, they're members of a, uh, of a local church. They're, these are men who believe the Bible in its entirety is the inerrant and infallible Word of God. And we're committed to spreading the truth of the Word of the Gospel of Jesus Christ so that others may come to a saving faith through that knowledge. Uh, we are we're men of the book, we're men who witness, men of faith, men, are, men of a separated walk, men with a compassionate heart, men of prayer, and men who give. Uh, you know, we passed out Bibles. Last year we did like 85 million Bibles. And since, since the Gideon started over 100 years ago, sometime last year the two billionth Bible was, was handed out. That's, now we talk about Bibles, and, and we pass out Bibles, and that's not our goal, is not to pass out Bibles. Our goal is change lives. When the Gideons were formed over 100 years ago, it was a witnessing society. There were two men, they, just, they, wanted, they were like traveling salesmen, the commercial men, traveling men, and they wanted to be witness for, witnesses for Jesus when they traveled. And, and that's, what they, uh, that's what they did. And then they decided, but their goal was change lives. That's what it was about then, that's what it's about now. These men, they, and then the association decided they could place Bibles in hotel rooms and then they'd have a, a, a witness. Even when they weren't there, there'd be a witness. There. So that, that, that started over, uh, that started in 1908. So in that, in that time, like two billion Bibles have been, and they are a very effective, uh, very effective uh, witnessing tool. That's, that's, and that's what they are. They're, it's a tool. It's God's holy word, but it's a tool. And it's still the people that, that, uh, that we'd like, like to reach. They're still, even though we pass out a Bible, every time your heart beats twice, two Bibles are placed somewhere around the world. And it's hard to believe that, uh, that that's possible. But, uh, and then there's still many people who don't know Jesus. They've never heard of Jesus. They, they don't have a Bible. They've never seen a Bible. So there's still an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of work to be done. So, so why am I here today? I'd like to ask for your help. I'd like to ask for your prayerful support. I'd like to ask you to pray for the for the Gideon Association, for the Gideons as they pass out Bibles, for the Bible, but more importantly, to pray for the people that receive these Bibles. That's 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 still what it's about. So we ask for your prayerful support there. Uh, we also could use some new members. If there's anybody that would like to uh, join a, a ministry that, that we think is pretty good, doesn't take up a lot of time, uh, we could we could use some help. If, you, if you're interested, you want to talk to me or my friend Dwayne Rasmus is back there. You can talk to him. T.C. Richardson's here. Look, these, these men are all getting used. If you'd like to talk to us about being, being a member, we'd sure be happy to talk to you about that. And I'm going to ask for your uh, for your financial support. It's it's the the, the local churches. It's, the support of the local churches is where, where that's where those those two billion that's billion with a B that's where them where they came from and that's 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 where the uh, most of the funds come from to uh, to purchase these uh, to purchase these Bibles that was, uh, these Bibles they cost like a uh, dollar and a quarter for this for this Bible that's and that's to print it ship it and hand it to hand it to someone that uh, that does that does uh, that needs God's word, um, and if you'd like to, if you'd like to help us, I'll be. We'll be around after the service if there's no Bible. If you'd like to donate, that would be uh, that would be good. Um, we also have. I don't know if you have a. I didn't see a rack there. We have we have cards. Uh, thinking of you cards and, and memory cards and honor cards that uh, can be used to purchase Bibles in someone else's name. If, Someone passes away. If you'd like to purchase some Bibles for them instead of flowers, that it, uh, we have cards that uh, that uh, can take care of that. And the flowers are, are nice. They last a while. They're gone. A Bible that's uh, uh, that's placed in a hotel room with a life expectancy of seven years has it has the opportunity of, of witnessing to 2,300 different people. So, if that room was full every night, but uh, 
So anyway, we have we have that available. So uh, uh, Hannah lived in. Uh, she was in Minneapolis. She'd left home, and she moved out. She moved in an apartment, and uh, after a while, she lost her job, and uh, things weren't going real well. She wasn't exactly in the best part of town. Her her neighbors were uh, prostitutes, drug dealers. So they had an answer for her. They had a solution to her problem. But she she did, she wasn't ready for that. So, but she had she hadn't eaten for some three days, and she, she decided she'd just uh, just kill herself rather than put up with this. So she decided the next morning she she'd do that. So she goes to bed, got a knife stuck under her bed. The next morning she wakes up, she reaches for that knife. Instead, uh, she pulled out a she picked up a Gideon Testament that was laying there. I don't know where it came from, but anyway. But she uh, she opened that up and she, she looked in uh, in Luke 12 where it said, don't worry, it's, uh, your heavenly father takes care of the birds, he'll certainly take care of you. So she thought about that. Then she thought about her earthly father. Well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just call him. She, and he, he answered his cell phone and he is, uh, he's in the parking lot of that, that uh, apartment building. Just happened to have a pizza in the front seat of his pickup. So when I... Uh, when this testimony was written, Hannah was, was in Montana. She was at the University of Montana serving with uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. So she, the word, God's word did not return void that day either. So. Well, thank you very much for, for listening. I appreciate your, appreciate your time. Yes, ma'am. Don't the Gideons furnish the ones for the armed forces too? Yes. Yeah, yeah we place, the Bibles are placed in hotels, motels. <clears throat> Uh, law enforcement agencies, members of the armed forces, they go to fire departments, uh, yeah, really colleges, universities. Boys, you know, spend some time bored and they, they read them because my grandson signed the page that, you know, where you accept Jesus. Yeah. And yeah, he deep. had to leave that little Bible at my house when he was home on leave. Hmm. So. And these Bibles have a, have a place in the front where you can sign it. To, this is my this is my Bible, but in the back, the plan of salvation, it goes through the plan of salvation, and tells you what you have to do to be saved, to be born again, and then there's a place where you can sign it and say, on this day, I did accept Jesus as my my Lord and Savior. Um, we have a we have a uh, we have a, a Gideon brother that's he's 90, 90 some years old now. He was at the when he left home. In the 40s, his mother gave him a Gideon Bible, and he stuck that in his pack. And he took that, he carried that with him for for several years. And at the and the night before the Battle of the Bulge, he said, "I think I have a Bible or somewhere." Everybody's pretty scared. He pulled that Bible out, and and he said, "You know, Lord, if you're real, uh, tell me something." Uh, he read uh, John 3:16, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life." And he said. Lord, I believe, I believe. And he said he just felt calm and peace come over him. And, and he said, you know, the guy and the other guys were nervous. He couldn't sleep. And he, he'd, he'd sleep at night. Just And, and now, he's probably, he probably passed, he, in his 90s, he passes up more Bibles than any of the rest of us. He didn't put together. He, just, he's, he's, uh, he, believes, he, he believes it, that's for sure. And he lives it. So thank you very much for allowing us to be here. It was interesting while, while Jerome was speaking, the passage came to my mind, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And I, I thought about that because at the funeral yesterday there were a lot of flowers. And flowers are beautiful, but they wither and turn to dust but the Word of God will never fail. Um, if you have your Bibles open, um, we are working through our identity in Christ. So open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, keeping in mind, everything that we're talking about here is for a believer, okay? 
that this only describes, and, and this is the brush whereby a Christian should be painted. Okay, so if you're not a Christian, these things don't apply to you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now i got to turn there. Um, we've talked about that we have been redeemed. We've talked about that we've been reconciled. We've talked about that we are a new creation. Last week, we, we talked about some of the attributes. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to start in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. <laughs> I thought that was going to go along with the reading. <laughs> For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If, um, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. You guys kind of get where I'm going with this? 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. Now, we have a, a really fancy highbrow word for this body. It's called church. And one of the fallacies that the enemy has pushed on to Christendom is that you don't need to be part of a church. Look, we just read this passage whereby God has implemented the church to serve as his body. In 2 Corinthians, it, it tells us we're his ambassadors. And we'd like to think of that as each of us individually being an ambassador. But we as a body, as a whole, are his ambassadors as well. Now, each of us serves a different role. That I thought that was beautifully demonstrated yesterday in all the different talents that God has blessed this church with. Uh, we had four or five people come to me and talk about what an incredible thing our worship team was and how we were so blessed to have such a worship team in such a small fellowship. I told him, well, that's not all of them. We've got a whole other worship team that can go up there. That God has blessed us. I've been in churches where they worship to CD because they didn't have someone to play the keyboard or the guitar or to lead singing. God has blessed this church. Okay? 
But one of the lies that we deal with on an ongoing basis, and, and to be honest with you, we all have probably thought at some point was, I don't need it. Okay? Let me emphasize this to you in as clear a way as possible. Lie! <laughs> okay? That is an untruth. That is not how God has designed the church to work, the body to work. We are not to operate independently, self-sufficiently. As a matter of fact, we're called to be codependent. And our sufficiency comes from God, but most often it comes through His body. God has put it together such that we build one another up. That we edify one another. Now, as such, each of us representing a different part. I, I, I love Paul's writings because Paul does not dance around. Paul puts it right to you. Okay? I don't know what part of the body God has made me. I don't know why, but it seems like he made me something to do with the mouth. <laughs> Which is, is really weird, and I know you guys don't believe this, but it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I started talking. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. No, it's okay. <laughs> I did. I got a lot of catching up to do. I got 30 years of catching up to do. I was five years old when I knew that God was calling me to the ministry. Okay? And I spent a lot of years trying to dodge that bullet. Even now, I question all the time, God, why would you choose me? There are people that are so much more eloquent, that are so much more relatable, that have so much more wisdom, and I think that's why. Because when I get up here in front of you, and every Sunday I still get sick to my stomach, and I keep hoping there's one more song. <laughs> Just one more. <laughs> but because I'm so desperate for him to speak through me. Because I, honestly, folks, I, I have nothing to offer you. In and of myself, I've got nothing But this, this is living, active, powerful. Mm -hmm. I want to know only what he would have me know. Unfortunately, in our lives, we gather a lot of knowledge that, that is actually very detrimental to our walk. And, and a lot of times, I have to kind of take a large portion of what I know and lay it down because it runs contrary to what I know, the truth that is here. We were talking yesterday in the service about the hope that we have. And the hope is not something that might be, it's something that will be. We're not hoping we might get to heaven. We know we're going to get to heaven. Our hope is when. Okay. So as a, a part of the body, there are certain things, there are certain benefits that come out of this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump through a lot of scriptures, so don't try and keep up. If you need a reference, come to me after. I'll, I'll give you the references, okay? Um, Romans 12, 1 through 5. We are a body that draws strength from each other according to the gifts that God has given us. Okay? God has gifted each of us so that we can draw strength from one another. The areas that I am lacking, you guys make up. You, you guys, you know what? You complete me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I saw most of that movie once. But I, that line, I hear it everywhere. You complete me. We complete each other. Okay? And, and we can't say, I don't need you. 
and, and, and it does absolutely no good to wish to be somebody else. It, it does no good to want to serve in a different capacity because you're not gifted there. That's not where God has designed you to serve. We, we look at certain things and, and, and honestly, the church in America has so destroyed how God has designed the body to work. We, we've created this hier hierarchical position and at the apex of it, we put a pastor. And it's like we build up this pedestal <coughs> called the ideal Christian and we set the pastor on top of it. And then we all gather around and play tip them. <laughs> <coughs> and we watch him rock back and forth and we wait for him to fall. And the pastor is expected to serve in every capacity in the body of Christ. Not according to scripture, but according to our idea. He's got to be an effective communicator. He's got to be an effective administrator. He's got to be a good businessman. He's got to know the word. And heaven forbid if he should forget to shake your hand. <laughs> he should push you just enough to draw you, but not so much as to make you uncomfortable. And we shake that pedestal. And then we have the audacity to be offended when he falls off. <gasps> I knew it! He was too good to be true! <laughs> well, yeah, he was too good to be true. He was not what you made him out to be. Look, folks, people that stand in front of the church are exactly like the people sitting in the church. Okay? We all struggle. We all have issues. We all have weaknesses. We all have failures. Okay? Some of mine are very obvious. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> but if the body works together the way that God has designed it, and, and honestly, this is one of the best bodies I've been in to see this. I don't have to answer everybody's need. As a matter of fact, I may not have to know everybody's need. Because you guys, integrating the way that God has designed it to work, will begin to meet each other's needs. And I love it when I hear that somebody had a need, and by the time I hear it, it's already been met because somebody already stepped up. That, that's the way it's supposed to work. That, that's the way it's supposed to work. We take care of each other. Now, let's look at some other things. What are other benefits to being a part of this body? Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Um, we encourage one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him and a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, first, there's a couple things that we need to draw out of this. Any transgression. And when he says caught in, the idea is not so much as I went, ha ha! Hand in a cookie jar. It's more like, help, I can't get my hand out. Okay? You're stuck. You're caught in that sin. Back in, in college, um, we used to do street ministry, and there was a skit that we did that was called Sin in a Box. And we had a, a guy that was very gifted in physical humor. And we would put this box out on the street, and he would come up to the box, and it was all done to music, and there was no talking, but he would look at the box and it had sin marked on the front of it. And he would reach in and he'd kind of poke at it. And then, then soon he'd step in and, and then 
before you knew it, he had both feet in, and then he's trying to get his feet out, and he reaches down to get his foot out, and his hand gets caught, and before you know it, he's twisted up like a pretzel in this little box. And he could not get himself out. And what happened was somebody had to come along and take him out of the box. Okay? That's Galatians 6, 1 and 2. You're caught in a sin. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Okay? When somebody's caught in a sin, we want to come at them with a the sword, don't we? Repent, you sinner! And bash them and dash them and cut them. And then whatever little pieces are left, we present as an offering to God. Look at the job we did. Oh, you just killed one of my children. A spirit of gentleness. Listen, Jesus spoke the truth always. He spoke the truth, but he spoke it in love. And he wasn't always mammy-pammy. Okay? When the rich young ruler came to him, Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He told him what he was lacking. And when the rich young ruler went away unhappy, Jesus didn't chase him down hoping to get a bigger tithe. Jesus walked him go, watched him go away, and he was sorrowful. <coughs> because he knew that man was caught in the sin of mammon. He loved his money. He loved his stuff. Okay? But he, he spoke the truth. Boy, when he spoke the truth to the Pharisees, the seven woes. Wow! You vipers! You whitewashed tombs! Dead men's bones. He was speaking the truth, and it was hard, but it was in love. Why? Because his hope, his desire, his longing was for them to turn and come home. These men who were teaching the very words of God had failed to understand them. We come in a spirit of gentleness. But it gives us a caution. Beware lest you too be caught. I think of David Wilkerson. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, um, there was a group put together, a, a committee by the government to look at the effects of pornography on America. And David Wilkerson was asked to be a part of this group. Well, unfortunately, the way they went about this was by viewing pornography. And David Wilkerson got caught. He got caught in the sin of pornography. Okay? And he was stuck for years. As a matter of fact, I, I believe that even though he was able to resist that sin, I think that was an area of weakness for him for the rest of his life. But see, he went in with every good intention, okay? But, but he got caught. Okay? So be careful lest you two be caught. So we encourage one another. We hold one another to account. We forgive each other. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? Forgiving someone. And Peter comes to Jesus and he says, how many times should I forgive my brother? And, and, and honestly, I think he's talking about Andrew. He's got my shirt again. Seven times? <coughs> Jesus re replies, no, 70 times seven. And I, I don't think Jesus was actually giving us a literal number. I think he was going so far beyond Peter's expectation, Peter's idea of self-righteousness, that, that Peter was just blown away. What? I don't want to have that many shirts. We forgive one another. You know, unforgiveness is a burden you place on yourself. It's a fetter that you willingly lock yourself into. Okay? 
You, you take it up and you carry it with you as a heaviness everywhere you go. Now, forgiveness is not an easy thing. There's a process. Okay? The, the first thing that we have to do is we have to realize that we have not forgiven them. Okay? Second thing that we have to do is we have to take it before God and lay it down on the altar before God. All unforgiveness stems from a hurt. All hurt done to you is done to God first. Okay? So the hurt that you feel, he has already felt. And then we have to willingly leave it there. Also often, this is my, my unforgiveness, this is my hurt. We take it to God and we lay it down and we give it to him. I'm going to put that down so you guys can see it because I want everyone to see my hurt. And, and we put it down and we say, God, here's my hurt. Take it. Help me to forgive. And, and, and I'm going to go about my business. <laughs> oh. God, here's my hurt. I want you to take it. Help me to forgive and move on. Okay, God, I gave it to you. I don't even want to see it anymore. I want you to take it and hold it and never give it back. Look, 70 times 7 if necessary. Lay it down. Lay it down. One of the things that we have failed to do, singularly failed to do, in the United States, and, and I don't know, but I'm guessing probably worldwide in the church, we have not disciplined ourselves to control our thoughts. Do you realize God requires you to do that? He expects it of you? Where are we to set our minds? We set our minds on things above, not on things of this earth. Okay? We take captive every thought. Every thought. So when that hurt comes back up and, and we want to revisit it and we want to play with it and we want to poke it and see if it's still tender and if it's not tender, we poke it hard enough so it is tender. We are to take control of those thoughts and say, no, I will not live here. By the measure I have been forgiven, I want to forgive. Everybody needs to change their cell phone tunes <laughs> to some kind of Christian music. <laughs> Preferably one that goes with my message. <clears throat> Mood music. <coughs> Okay, so forgiving one another, look, it's easy to look around this room and go, yeah, I can forgive them. I mean, quite honestly, I'm not invested enough in myself for them to hurt me. But look at the person sitting right next to you who might happen to be your spouse. <laughs> yes, you're to forgive them too. You are to not hold any bitterness, any unforgiveness toward that person. Um, Jesus wrapped up the sample prayer by saying, by the measure you forgive, you will be forgiven. I don't think that's a threat to your salvation. I think it's a quality of your life. You want to walk in forgiveness? Learn to forgive. Release other people from their burden, and you'll begin to see how much God has released you from. You know? You might owe them a day's wages of forgiveness, but God has forgiven you an eternity of sin. So in the body of Christ, we have forgiveness. Think about that, if that were to play out operatively in this thing. Where you know every time you stumbled, it would be okay. We're going to put you back up on your feet, we're going to brush you off, we're going to bandage the wounds, and we're going to continue walking alongside you. Imagine how that would work in the church. If, the, if that were to function that way. That's the goal. That's what we aspire to. That's what we are moving toward. Okay? <clears throat> so forgiveness. Love. Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. See, we take who we are and we lay that down at the cross. We're buried and we're resurrected into a new life. This new life is the life that Christ lives and the love that he has for us, we now have for each other. Oof. Okay. That means you guys have to love me the way that Christ does. Okay. That means I have to love you as Christ does. Means that we have to love each other as Christ does. But, but look how it reads here again. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That last little phrase trips me up. That means I've got to give myself for you. And sometimes you guys make that hard. <laughs> You know. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, honestly, <coughs> if you guys were ever to see even a portion of what Christy has to give up for me, um, her lovely free spirit, <coughs> life is good all the time, everywhere, and God put her with me who can find the fertilizer in any rose garden. <laughs> Christy gets up and looks outside and says, what a beautiful day. And I look outside and go, oh, it's going to be hot. <laughs> this, is, this is the way that this works. We give ourselves up for each other. Okay? We, we prefer one another another above ourselves. That's, that's, that's the life that we're called to. Okay. But man, my game's on. Why do they have to have a need now? You know, one of the things that uh, I have been reprimanded for is I don't take Mondays off. I have a, a number of pastor friends who take Mondays off. Monday is their Saturday, I guess. And, and the thing I have not yet comprehended is how to make you guys plan your emergencies for Tuesday and Sunday. <laughs> when I get that figured, then I'll take Mondays off. See, I, I don't see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus or the apostles planned a day to take off. You take them as God gives them. And if it happens to be a Thursday, then I get Thursday off. If it happens to be a Tuesday, I get Tuesday off. But, but God knows when I need a rest, and I trust him to give it to me when I need it. He makes your heart go fast. <laughs> yeah, and then he makes the golden girls tell me to sit down. <laughs> and all of them look at me with that look in my eyes it makes me just go <laughs> Joan is especially good at it <laughs> so we are all members of one body but we're not just this body we're all members of the body of Christ so that means that all of the churches that are around us are members of that same body. That means the, the churches that are all over this state, all over this country, all over this world are united as one body. And we get so caught up, you know, in, in our differences that we forget that it's our sameness that unites us. Okay? We get caught up, oh my gosh, they're a thumb. I can't worship with a thumb. I'm an elbow. All the elbows over here, please. Thumbs over there. What, what binds us? It's Christ and Christ crucified. That's, that's what binds us. So we should be able to look 
uh, away from thumbs or elbows or eyelids, we should be able to overlook those differences because of the incredible thing that unites us, that makes us the same. Loving each other, forgiving each other, building one another up, encouraging one another. But in all of this, I can find nowhere in Scripture where it says, yeah, you don't need to be a part of that. I, I can't find it. And I, I see people, and, and they, they do what, what I like to call hermeneutic gymnastics. They bend it and twist it and pull it and flip it and flop it. And they come up with this conclusion that in their brain is reasonable to get what they wanted all along. Look, we take the word for what it says. And when God says something once, you pay attention. But if he tells you multiple times, it's important, folks. So, challenge today. As the body of Christ, <coughs> love each other. Encourage each other. Guard one another. Forgive each other. Live, walk, operate in forgiveness. Start that as your basis. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start it with hurt, with unforgiveness, with anger. I'm gonna operate in forgiveness. I'm starting here and moving forward. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you because you have made us what we are. And Father, you are continuing to shape us, to mold us, to fashion us and to that body which would perfectly reflect your Son to the world around us. And I ask, Lord God, that we would be pliable to your hands, that we would be moldable, that, Father, we wouldn't resist the work that you're doing. I ask, Lord God, that you would make of this body what you would, and that, Father, you would bring to completion the work that you've begun even as you have promised. And we bless you, Father, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.